Wow, look at that. They got quiet. <laughs> Didn't even have to say anything. Well, good afternoon. This is a, an extreme pleasure uh, for the Baker Institute to welcome Mark Leisure, CEO of Philip 66, to our surroundings today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, Judge. A little bit about uh, Mark. I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, he's from Iowa, which I find very interesting. Uh, you know, we're used to a lot of Aggies and people like that being in the energy industry in Houston, but not so many come from Iowa. Mm -hmm. so, so let me start by asking a question that I like to ask a lot of people. And that is, how did you get where you are? And I want to phrase it this way. You know, when you were 10 years old and you were playing in the backyard with your friends, did you sit down and say, you know, someday I'm going to be CEO of Phillips 66? <laughs> That's a great question, Judge. Uh, first, I, I want to make a confession that I, I'm, I'm an Iowa State guy, but the original name was Iowa State A&M. So I'm uh, just saying there might, there might be an indirect connection. I don't, I don't confess that often, but in this context, I thought it was okay. But uh, when I was 10 years old playing in the backyard. I had five brothers, so we were probably pounding on each other. And, and uh, uh, my hometown has a population of about 600 people. Uh, the main, the main uh, business was agriculture. Uh, there were the, the two largest businesses in town were grain processing facilities or gathering facilities and fertilizer facilities. So not only uh, was being the CEO of any company light years away from my imagination. I, I ended up going, I was good in math and science, so I should be a doctor, and uh, I had no idea what an engineer was, honestly. I, I, the engineer was the guy that pulled the trains into town, we loaded them up with grain, <laughs> and then they left, and that was, that was it. And I discovered engineering at Iowa State, and one thing left to, <laughs> led to another, and, uh, and here I am. Let me dive into that a little bit more, though. Sure. You're at, you're at Iowa State, chemical engineer? Chemical engineer. How did you come across Phillips 66, or how did they come across you? Mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of graduate students yeah. and other students, and they, they always want to know, you know, how do you get these places? Well, it took me a little while to find chemical engineering, <clears throat> and I found out I loved chemical engineering, and uh, one of my professors that was a mentor suggested that maybe I should consider graduate school. That was another thing that was not on my radar. I, w I wanted to go out and get a job. I had worked my way through undergraduate. It was time to go do something else. He said, well, fill out this paper. Maybe somebody will pay you to go to graduate school. And so I did, and it happened. And uh, I got a fellowship uh, and to work on catalysis at Iowa State. And when it came time to get a job, I, I was convinced I didn't want to go full time into academia. I wanted to go out into industry, and at that time, Phil Petroleum uh, was one of the leading technical innovators in, in catalysis, and uh, they recruited at Iowa State. And, uh, and of course, most of the small towns in Iowa have a Phillips Shield floating around in them somewhere, so they, they were a known quantity, but I hadn't really connected what I was doing to what they were doing. And so they gave me the opportunity. I did a little background research, and they had some fantastic, some fantastically prolific scientists and engineers there. Uh, at the research center on the west side of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So I joined them, and I thought I would spend my entire career doing innovative things, creating new catalysts, new new chemicals, new routes to energy uh, for the rest of my career. That lasted about four years. <laughs> so you went. So you went straight to Bartlesville. Went straight to Bartlesville. Yes. Which I could spend a lot of time talking about Bartlesville and their sports teams, but I won't <laughs> get into that. Phillips 66 used to be well known for sports teams yes. back in the Phillip day. Phillips 66ers. Yeah. So, since we're talking about Phillips 66, uh, a lot of people are really confused. What is Phillips 66 versus Chevron Phillips versus Conoco Phillips? Well, <clears throat> It all started and, and as Phillips. We have Bur about an hour. Yeah, it all started. <laughs> I'll give you the Cliff's Note version. It all started as Phillips Petroleum Company back in the 20s with Frank Phillips and his brothers coming to Bartlesville, discovering oil, and it grew into an oil, gas, and petrochemicals company. And you know, when when the merger craze happened, um, you know, Jim Mulva was running uh, Phillips 66 at the time, and uh, he decided to merge our 
pretty strong chemicals business with Chevron's chemicals business to create Chevron Phillips Chemicals. And it's one of the most successful uh, global petrochemical companies on the planet because of that merger. It really created a lot of strengths, a lot of critical mass to help it, help it grow. So that was, that was the first step in that process. But then a rapid succession of acquisitions and mergers took place and eventually Phillips 66 and Conoco merged in to form Conoco Phillips. Uh, which was, and they had acquired Tosco Refining. So they had this major, massive refining complex, upstream, midstream, downstream, and uh, and and and, and Mova was a financial genius, is a financial genius, and and he realized that we could create more value for shareholders by splitting up the company. So in 2012. Phillips 66 reemerged, spinning out of ConocoPhillips, and all of the downstream assets, all of the refineries, all of, and the midstream assets went into Phillips 66, as well as the ownership of 50% of Chevron Phillips. And so that's so you've got ConocoPhillips that's upstream oil and gas. They're out there exploring and producing oil and gas, and they no longer uh, the, the gasoline you buy from a Conoco station or a Phillips station has no connection to Conoco Phillips. That's all coming from Phillips. And to make it even more confusing, not only do we have the, the Phillips 66 brand out there that you see, the Conoco brand that you see, if you go to the West Coast, the Big Orange 76, if you watch the Dodgers play baseball, that's our brand as well. So you got to have a scorecard to keep track of it all at the end of the day. So there is those shields you talked about earlier are still up. They're still up. We have, I think, 7,200 <clears throat> branded uh, retail outlets across North America. Oh, and if you go to the Euro if you go to Europe, the UK, it's Jet. That's our brand, and it's a pretty prolific brand in the in Europe and the continental Europe as well as the UK. <laughs> well, let's combine a couple of things. You, you mentioned innovation back at the beginning. That's mm -hmm. what appealed to you about the company. We live in a very uh, changing world right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the oil and gas industry obviously is looking at a lower carbon world. Yep. What are some of the innovations that Philip 66 is engaged in that you can talk about? Sure. That uh, you see going forward. What What's the company going to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? A absolutely. Well, our, our mission is to provide energy and improve lives. And that, that sounds like a nice, catchy catchphrase, uh, easy to remember, but we absolutely believe in that mission. And the events of the last few years have really driven home the importance of that mission. Providing energy and improving lives is critical to all of us. If you think about what your life would be like without access to affordable, clean energy, uh, it would be pretty miserable. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a connection between providing energy and improving lives. There are still people in the world that burn wood and dung and things like that, and then their, their lives are cut short because they don't have access to clean, affordable energy. Europe went through uh, a horrific time where their energy sources from Russia were cut off and they had to scramble to make sure that they had the energy for their day-to-day -day lives, for their industry. It matters. And our view is we're going to be in the business of providing energy and improving lives for a very long time. And we're a bit agnostic about where that energy comes from. Uh, today, we are, we, we are a major processor of oil and gas into liquid hydrocarbon fuels, as well as petrochemical feedstocks and petrochemicals. And the world needs those things, and the world needs what those things do. But we're focused on how, to we, how do we continue to provide those things to the world in a form that they can afford to use, and that's less impactful on the environment. And we're absolutely committed to that. And we will look at whatever forms of energy we can to continue on that mission. And we believe in all the above. We believe that wind's going to have a, have a role to play. Solar's going to have a role to play. We believe that electric vehicles will have a role to play. But we also believe in the long-term viability of liquid hydrocarbons as part of that energy mix. And I could, I could talk for the entire hour about that. But that's who we are, and that's what we do. And, and as an industry, we're full of very talented, a lot of intellectual firepower, engineers, scientists, people that are committed to lower the carbon footprint of what we do. We recognize that we have to do that. But there's this big dual challenge out there that we have to lower the carbon footprint of what we do 
but you still have to be able to afford to get from point A to point B. You still have to have the ability to go to a grocery store and get affordable food to eat, and that gro those groceries have to be delivered to that store, and those farmers have to have energy to produce the food that you're going to eat, and the whole system, the whole ecosystem that we enjoy relies on access to energy, and we're going to be part of that for a long time. Yeah, that kind of opens up two paths of questions. So one is about the energy and seconds about the people, but let's go on the energy front first. Last week, the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies hosted the Energy Summit, Baker Botts Energy Summit. And one of the panels was about transport fuels for the future. Mm -hmm. Right now, nearly all transportation modes use hydrocarbon yes. of some sort. But in the future, uh, we're talking about ocean shipping, railroads, trucks, airplanes using different things. Mm -hmm. What do you see happening in those various modes of transportation? What, what are going to be the fuels? Yeah, different modes have different challenges. Yeah, we, we recognize that electric vehicles are going to take market share away from, from gasoline. And we, we believe that there are, there, there's the right time and the place for electric vehicles. We also believe that Technologies, you need to look at the life cycle carbon footprint of technologies to make sure we're making the right decisions because we're going to invest trillions of dollars in these things. And are you really going to get the result that you thought you were going to get when you invest? So be careful when you're analyzing what technologies win and what technologies lose that you understand the whole carbon footprint and the environmental impact of what you're doing. But personal vehicles, it's more easy they're more easily supplanted by other things than hydrocarbons. EVs work great. You can get from point A to point B. Maybe you have some range anxiety. I personally think hybrid vehicles are a better solution. And if you look at the life cycle carbon footprint of a hybrid vehicle, it's better than 100% EV, and it's better than a 100% internal combustion engine. And, but the world seems to want to jump all the way to EVs because it feels better. Uh, and, and so we've got to avoid doing things that feel better that the math and the science and the thermodynamics don't support. Now, if you look at aviation, aviation is going to be one of the toughest things to decarbonize. And that's why we're working on sustain routes to sustainable aviation fuel, where you can take you know, biomass-based feedstocks, convert it to something that is exactly like aviation fuel that is burned today, and you've got a circular uh, economy around aviation fuel. Heavy haul diesel. Um, we're converting an entire refinery in San Francisco today. We're going to wean it off of consuming oil and, and turn it over to consuming used cooking oil and animal fats and soybean oil and canola oil. And we will produce actually a, a diesel that's a little better than diesel made from, from a traditional hydrocarbons. And we've converted over 600 retail outlets in California where you could pull up with a diesel truck today uh, that, that's burning you know, normal diesel, and you can fill your tank with this diesel, and it's it's <coughs> completely interchangeable. And uh, and now the challenge with that is, the feedstocks coming into that facility cost about two hundred dollars a barrel, and the product value in the marketplace is about a hundred dollars a barrel. And so it does. You don't have to be a rice mathematician to understand that 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 economically doesn't work, but. The state of California incentivizes it. The federal government incentivizes it. So we think this of this in terms of not only are we producing renewable diesel, but we're producing streams of cash that support that. And that will provide the critical mass to get this facility up and running. It'll be one of the largest in the world. Uh, and it's got good, strong economics. And it'll be there for a very long time. So diesel, that's, that's the part of the answer. Aviation, that's part of the answer. But then you have to step back, though and think about the whole universe of, of energy consumption. And the, the world today consumes about 102 million barrels of oil per day, not per year, per day, every day. And it's growing at one or 2% a year. If we took all the renewable feedstocks today and we could build all these facilities, uh, you could replace maybe 5% of that today with the feedstocks. So it is a massive challenge that we have. And, you know, and, and so we've got to make good choices. We could waste trillions of dollars going down the wrong path. That's not, you know, we're not putting that out there to resist any change. We'll embrace change that makes sense, but it has to make sense with, the, <clears throat> with respect to physics. It has to make sense with respect to thermodynamics, chemistry. And at the end of the day, 
It has to make sense with economics. We know how today to take carbon dioxide and water, and we can turn that into jet fuel. All it takes is a ton of energy and a ton of money to do it. And you wouldn't be able to afford a plane ticket, but we can do it. So that's, that's the dilemma. The technologies all are there to do these things, but the question is, what can the world afford and at what pace can we do it? We all wish we had nuclear fusion, you know, endless sources of energy, that'd be great. We can take that electricity and we can convert all the water to hydrogen, everything would be clean. Good, that, that's great, but we have to sit down and what are the practical challenges to do that? That might be here in 50 years, 150 years, 1,000 years, I don't know. But in the meantime, we have to address the world's challenges with what we have today and just keep moving, moving that line back and get cleaner and better at what we do. And that's what we're committed to doing around our refineries, our NGL systems, is getting cleaner every day, lowering the carbon footprint of what we do every day. And while the world is fighting over all these other things, we're going to get better and better and better. And we're going to contribute to that energy mix that ensures that the world has the energy they need to thrive. No, I said there were two paths I was going to go down. The second one is about people. People. Um, you know, here on a Rice campus, probably on any college campus, uh, if you talk about, do you want to go to work for the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry? Uh, you, you get a certain look. If you say the energy industry, you get a different look. But, but how are you handling the recruiting of the talent that's absolutely going to be necessary mm -hmm. to make these innovations you're talking about? Well, you heard me just lay out the challenge that we have, and there's no easy answers, which is why we need the best and brightest to work on it. And I would look any college recruit in the eye, and I do this often, that if you want to save the planet, if you want to make humanity better, if you want to ensure opportunities for future generations, get in the energy industry. The world is a miserable place without clean, affordable, abundant energy. And if you want to make a difference, get in the energy <laughs> industry or learn as much as you can about the economics and the possibilities of energy if you're going into geopolitics. The more you know about energy, I will, t I will guarantee you that the intersection is very quick between geopolitics and energy. And if you don't have, if you're in a country that doesn't have access to energy, you're, you're going to be in a very difficult place as the world continues to evolve. Wars are fought over energy. Uh, people are sacrificed over energy. So to, to have access to clean, affordable, abundant energy and to have wise people, smart people, figuring out how to make it cleaner and less impactful on the environment every step of the way is absolutely critical. But I will tell you that one thing I've learned, particularly over the last five or six years, is there's no such thing as clean energy. It's just a matter of how you clean up after yourself. Wind energy isn't clean, you have to build all those windmills and go out there. Solar energy isn't clean, you have to figure out how to build solar panels without having a footprint. Everything leaves a footprint. If you're wise though, you'll figure out how to clean up after yourself. What is the least costly way to get the cleanest possible solution? And we've got to have policies that don't try to pick and choose particular technologies because we could send the world down the wrong path, waste trillions of dollars, and be worse off than we are today. We need wise people, we need smart people, good technical people, good policy people that will intersect and make those good choices for us so we don't end up in a bad place. And we are right in the mix of this right now. The world's in an inflection point where we can make major decisions about energy policy that could be an absolute disaster. They could be an economic disaster. And one of the challenges we face today in the US is we really don't have an energy policy. We're trying to incentivize this and incentivize that and don't do this and don't do that, where we should have a system that incentivizes the best technologies to win and the best companies to win. That's, that's, what's, that's what we're built on, is competition. And if you have a level playing field for technologies through something like a carbon tax or a cost of carbon, we can all plug that into our spreadsheets. We can all put in our best ideas and we'll come, in, come up with the best solutions and the best answers for the economy and for the people in that economy so we can all thrive and do what we can do to make the economy better. Well, since you've gotten into policy and we're sitting in the Baker <laughs> Institute for <coughs> Public Policy, uh, we're, we're, one of the things I think a lot of us are, are grappling with is the public thinks there's a binary choice. Mm -hmm. It's electric 
or it's hydrocarbon. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned California. Uh, you know, they're kind of going that direction. Mm -hmm. And what they're telling truckers, they have to be, what, carbon neutral by 35 or something yep. like that. The date may be wrong. How do you interact with, how, how does your company interact with the federal government, state governments, even local governments, to try and get your point across? Well, it's fascinating what the public narrative is and what the private narrative is, because there's a fashionable public narrative that a lot of politicians have to engage in and privately, they'll have a more practical, pragmatic discussion. And so we tried to engage. I'm shocked. At, <laughs> at a more practical, pragmatic. Well, I spent a lot of time in Washington last year when gasoline prices were high talking about that very thing. And, and uh, um, the, the Democratic side of the aisle was wanting to implement um, export bans because, well, gee, if we don't have enough gasoline, gasoline prices are going up. Uh, we'll ban the export of gasoline, that'll drive prices down. And, and we sat down with the right people in the White House and explained to them that the Northeast, where they had a lot of voters and you have, a, you have a, an election coming, the Northeast imports almost all of its gasoline or the vast majority of its gasoline. And, and you will skyrocket the price of gasoline in the Northeast and you'll have a glut of gasoline on the Gulf Coast. And there are policy limitations, policy limitations today that limit us from moving that those hydrocarbons from the Gulf Coast to the Northeast, and they were, well, we can't change those policies, and, and, but they realized that an export ban would have been disastrous. So they, they do listen when you can get to the right people. But before we get off this whole fuels discussion, uh, you're, you're talking about drop-in fuels as, as a transitional. Mm -hmm. The original equipment manufacturers are, have you been able to deal with them? I mean, uh, I, full disclosure, I'm, this is a shameless plug. I'm, I'm frequently on a Sirius XM radio station called Road Dog Trucking. <laughs> and if you're not listening, it's channel 146. You get to hear what the truckers think. And their complaint, you know, particularly the independent owner operators, uh, they own these trucks, their life savings are tied up in them. Mm -hmm. They don't want to put anything in them that might you know, mess up their warranty. Mm -hmm. How how's that working out? There's, I don't want to go into too technical depth. Uh, my, my PhD will start coming through, but uh, you know, there are challenges uh, with biodiesel because biodiesel has oxygen in it and it can cause problems, and they can you can only put so much in. Renewable diesel is just as good, if not better, in an existing diesel truck as traditional okay, diesel. Before you get off that. What's the difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel? Yeah. Because the public kind of yeah. uses those interchangeably. So renewable diesel chemically looks the same as traditional diesel. Biodiesel, think of biodiesel. Biodiesel is like ethanol and gasoline. It's, it's an oxygenate. And it will, it will burn, but it will cause you problems if you have too much biodiesel in a traditional diesel engine. Just like you can't put too much ethanol in a, in a traditional internal combustion engine based on gasoline because it'll cause problems. But what are the feedstocks for the two? The, the feedstocks are similar for the two, but, one, but the processing is different. And, and so you, you, you clean up things. We're spending a lot of money on our San Francisco refinery called Rodeo Refinery to clean up those feedstocks so none of the bad things are in there. And that's what most of the capital investment is associated with. So we can take just about any renewable hydrocarbon and process it through this facility. and It'll be pristine diesel fuel when it comes out the other end. Since you mentioned your PhD, I'm gonna pivot and go back. Uh, to, to your personal story. Yeah. Your degrees are all in chemical engineering? Yes. No business? No. Nope. But you're running one of the country's major businesses? School of Hard Knocks. Well, yeah. now that, that's an interesting thing because, again, we, we've got students and grad students here, and, you know, how do you get there? I mean, you would think that an MBA would be necessary, mm -hmm. but instead, you're a chemical engineer. Do you just dazzle them with your <laughs> PhD well, knowledge or what? I think um, throughout my career, I've focused on what are the problems that need to be solved and solving those problems and collaborating with the people around me and learning enough about what the brilliant MBA students in here know 
to get along, but then turn to those with have M that have MBAs and say, okay, help, help me understand that we're going the right, the right path here. So everything is very team-based, team-oriented. And, uh, and I think if you always, uh, if you're willing and be humble enough to surround yourself with brilliant people, um, you, can, you can go a long ways. Let's go global then. Okay, um, I dodged that question. <laughs> <laughs> That'll let you off. Uh, what facilities, what activities, you, you mentioned the UK and mm -hmm. JET, uh, but w what else does Phillips 66 do around the world? And a follow-up question to that is, what do you see the, the impact of, now we have two wars going on, uh, on, on all of those facilities and on all mm -hmm. those activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the largest investments we have overseas are through Chevron Phillips Chemical. We have a large footprint in Saudi Arabia, a large footprint in Qatar. And so, of course, we're, well, we're horrified about what's happening in the Middle East today. There is some geography between them. Uh, but if that should happen to spill over into a more massive complex, it would be even more tragic, and of course it could impact our facilities there. We worry about what it does to the supply and demand for, for the products that we produce, uh, but that's really secondary to the human tragedy. If you look at Russia invading Ukraine, that turned the logistics and the supply and demand for, for oil and natural gas on its head. You blow up a major natural gas artery from, uh, from Russia into Europe, even though Europe was trying to get away from natural gas, that is a, an energy deficit overnight. And the energy system in the world is very finely balanced. A little bit too much and prices go down. A little bit too little and prices go up. And so these things can very quickly roil the energy and the products business. And those are the kinds of things that we work on. But, but globally, that's, that's our biggest footprint. But we do export a tremendous volume of gasoline, diesel, propane, butane across the planet into, into China. China's economy is suffering today, and so their demand is down, and we're watching that carefully to see how that ultimately plays out. So it is, you know, in, in the energy universe, everything is interconnected. What you do every day impacts the energy economics and what goes on in the world, and so we watch that. We've got We've got organizations in Singapore, Calgary, London, uh, around the world that monitors all those kinds of things and trades and moves things to where we can create the most value every day, 24-7. So let, let me ask it this way. What, you, you mentioned China is, I won't say they're in decline, but right now their uh, economy is, is not what, it's not as robust as it yeah. has been. Uh, where do you see the growth areas mm -hmm. around the globe in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah, Ch China has substantial challenges. The, the demographics of China are a long-term challenge. And there really were two economies in China, are two economies in China. The in internal demand consumption of Chinese, and Chinese are incredible consumers. They're inc incredible entrepreneurial. Uh, they just happen to be in a dictatorial system that limits their, their, their choices. They had an incredible labor advantage for a long time. That labor advantage has kind of disappeared. So the other economy is they would import plastic pellets and they would export all the stuff that you go to Walmart or Target or anywhere else to buy. I believe all of those opportunities are going to shift somewhere else because they no longer have an advantage there. They'll still have a lot of internal consumption going on there, but you'll see and we're seeing today some of those facilities show up in Mexico or back in the U.S. or in Vietnam or in India. So there's still the need for that low-cost labor input to, to produce the products that we all take for granted every day, but it'll probably shift away from China and show up in some of those other locations. There's also a lot of geopolitical concerns around China, and you know, what if, what if China does something like Russia did and we've got to suddenly shift our supply chains out of China. It's a much bigger problem than we had in Russia because our supply chains for the things that you consume are so deep into China that you can't turn that off overnight. If you take a multivitamin, most of those vitamins are produced in China. If you, uh, if you have a smart refrigerator, the chips that make it smart are probably produced in China. The high-end chips, elsewhere, Taiwan, US, but the, the chips that 
run your car, the simple things, the, the Internet of Things chips are all produced in China. So that is, is the real challenge with China. If, they, if there should be some demographic collapse or if they should invade Taiwan and we have to say oh, we have to embargo everything from China, a lot of stuff goes away overnight. We have a very active U.S.-Mexico relations mm -hmm. group here at the Baker Institute. And uh, if I've read correctly, Mexico is now the U.S.'s leading trade partner. Mm -hmm. What relationships does Philip 66 have with Mexico? We, yeah, we, we, we send products to, to Mexico, energy products. Pemex doesn't produce enough energy for, for Mexico. Chevron Phillips uh, has similar <coughs> trade relationships into Mexico. I think Mexico is one of, going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries as companies de-risk their supply chains. And de-risk is a nice word to say we're pulling, we're pulling out of here, but we got to get production here. I think Mexico Mexico does have an ongoing labor advantage, and frankly, people are migrating back into Mexico because they can go home and have great careers and provide for their families. So I think that's a great development in Mexico. We need, there's, there's crime and governance issues and, and rule of law issues in Mexico, but Mexico is really uh, on a good positive trend and will be an outstanding trade partner for us for, for decades and decades to come. Okay. Let's go back internal with Phillips 66. Um, how many employees? We got about 14,000 employees worldwide. And how do you as a leader <clears throat> lead, motivate, inspire, whatever term we want to use? Communicate, communicate, communicate. And, and, and you can't communicate too much. You have to be clear, concise, and very direct. Uh, you can't leave people in a confused state. They need to know where we're going. We need 14,000 people knowing where we're going and how they can contribute to that. We just spent four days uh, with our board of directors talking about what our strategies are going to be going forward. And the next step is to take that to our employees so they understand where we're going as a company, how they can contribute to it, and how they can help us create value. And so there's no question about what role they play. That's, and if you can get 14,000 people to do that, I think you can win out in, out in the competitive landscape. Do, do you have a, an idea of the average age of your employees? Do you have an aging employee It's getting base? younger every day. Okay. It's getting younger every day. It's where we are seeing, and through COVID particularly, you know, there's, I think I may be the last baby boomer in the, in, in the mix. Uh, it's, you know, that generation has largely moved out of the workforce and and a tremendous amount of talent is coming in at, at the very young end of the workforce. So it's probably been, we, we call it the great shift change. It's, uh, it's probably been the most dramatic uh, demographic shift since maybe the end of World War II when all, all of the, the soldiers and sailors came home and entered the workforce. I, I, I grew up as an oil field brat with Humble Oil, and I think my dad moved 20 times in 25 years mm -hmm. from oil field to oil field. and then, um, I actually worked briefly for Exxon. Mm -hmm. He never agreed to that name change. He always worked for Humble, but nevertheless. Oil companies used to have a policy of moving people regularly to train them in other fields of endeavor, if you will. Does Phillips 66 do that still, or are people more resistant to moving to a completely different area? I think it's a, it's a slightly different model, I think, well, because in the downstream business and refining business, you've got hard assets that don't move around. In the oil business, you gotta go wherever you find oil, and you're finding oil every place, and some places are great to go live and some not so great to live. So we've got a more limited set, but certainly I think it's advantageous in your career to see what's going on in other locations, and you can, it's, it's a, a good way to develop uh, your career. Uh, and the, the, the whole perspective on careers is changing pretty dramatically, and we've had to look at what is the right mix of workplace flexibility, uh, even locally, uh, versus even moving across the country or across the globe. There are, there are still plenty of employees that will embrace opportunities to go overseas. I wish we had more opportunities for employees overseas, because I think we'd have a, we have a long line of people that are interested in that. Uh, but the bigger challenge has been uh, balancing the dynamic of, uh, of, of work home, 
uh, dual career families, the number of dual career families is, is increased rapidly and how, how do you help them manage childcare? We absolutely want them to have a healthy, happy family life, aging, aging parents. That whole dynamic is, is really front and center with us now and we've done things to afford people flexibility uh, and technology has enabled that. And we had to ramp up that technology in COVID and we're glad we have it. We're glad that we have people back in the office because there's really a, a lot of cultural advantages to having people in the office, a, a lot of innovation advantages to have people in the office, but we also are affording flexibility because we know people can get their work done at home. Uh, and we're, we're striking that balance between getting all everyone together to have that critical mass to have those conversations, those sparks and those, you know, those discussions over the, over the coffee pot, but also we recognize that because of the pressures on families to having the ability to work from home on occasion is, is pretty important as well. And if, if there's a hurricane headed for Houston, we can press the button and tell everybody, work from home, make sure you, get, make sure you take your, your, your laptop home tonight because you might be working from home for the next two weeks. And as long as there's power where they live, uh, they'll be able to get their jobs done. So one more question before we go to the audience. Okay. Um, what's your biggest concern? My biggest concern, uh, you know, we, we, we ask our employees to focus on the things that they can control. And I've got no, no concerns about our employees focusing on the things they control. It's the things we can't control. You know, we've, we've been through, you know, the, the tough times of COVID. Now we've kind of got a playbook for that. And so we'll, we know how to respond to that. But, you know, the, the, the geopolitical uncertainties that can roil our business, we can have all these great strategies and we can be headed down a path towards value creation but you can have events that turn the world upside down. And those are the things that it's difficult uh, to plan for. You, you, have a, you try to have as robust a balance sheet as you can, just like you would at home. You want to be prepared for any uncertainty, but you know, the, the world can, can rattle your cage pretty hard. And those are the things that you, can't, that you just can't plan for. Okay. At this point, I want to open it up. Uh to questions from the audience. We have microphones that will come to you if you'll raise your hand. Don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. I've got two right back there, uh -huh. side by side. Excuse me for pointing, but it's, I can't think of any other way to do it. First, thank you for your remarks. I'm very much uh, a part of the oil and gas industry, the old oil and gas industry, but very interested in the transition. The major oil companies had a tradition of sending fresh, young geoscientists to training, uh, either, whether it was internal uh, in a big company like Exxon or Shell, you know, their learning centers were very well known and highly respected. Um, and or the mid-sized companies would send people to uh, outsource companies for training to teach them how to find oil and gas. In this new world of carbon sequestration, of lithium batteries, these are resources that geoscientists particularly will be sent off to look for. Mm -hmm. What is your company doing to train people to embrace the new technology that's going to be needed for finding these new resources. Yeah, well, we're not involved in exploration for those kinds of resources. We are involved in the technologies that will exploit those resources. And we are very active in both seeking people that have that knowledge and affording people the opportunities to go learn more about those things. And we also are focused on developing future leaders. We have a very good process when we bring for instance, young engineers into the system to pre prepare them to be fantastic process engineers. And we're now we're extending the same, well, and we do that for our commercial organization as well. We have a program to develop you know, commercial traders and things like that. Uh, we've recently accelerated our efforts in leadership development right here at Rice. We've outsourced that somewhat to, to Rice University and they're helping us develop programs to develop future leaders and we're very excited about that. So we, we are in the mix and we're looking for opportunities everywhere to make sure that everybody that comes to the door has the opportunity to find 
their path to the future? What is their career going to look like? What can they do to, to create value for themselves and for the company? And we got to make sure that we're unlocking that for everybody along the way. I believe the gentleman next to you had a question. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm a grad student from the MGA at the Rice University. So I have questions uh, about the, you know, uh, the trilemma, energy trilemma, but the reliability, affordability, and also sustainability. Uh, what do you think, like, uh, like the best policy, the practices policy that uh, you know every governments can do in the, uh, to 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 deal with this energy trilemma in uh, from the energy uh, companies' uh, point of view, and also like the second question about the you know like uh, statistically the United States is the only the only country that uh, in the top ten uh, like both. Uh, carbon emitters in total net and also in the per capita. So, uh, so it means that uh, in like as a country, US, uh, United States is the top emitters, like ten, top ten, and also like as individual, each individual they also uh, produce uh, like a lot of uh, carbon emission. So, uh, what do you think like the energy companies, like oil and gas company, can do about that uh, trend? Thank you. I, I think that, the, and I touched on this earlier, that the number one thing is to have have a national policy that drives the, the, the right behaviors. And, and I truly believe that some cost of carbon has to be introduced. That if you recognize a cost of carbon, every, every engineer, every MBA has a spreadsheet to determine whether a project is economic or not. And they all have a, a blank spot there in their models that said here's the cost of carbon waiting for that day to happen and it changes the economics and it levels the playing fields so we make the right choices around the right technologies because if you're trying to limit co2 from getting in the atmosphere then put some penalty in place for that some cost recognition in place for that and then you will ha you will drive the right behaviors that will reduce that number right now you've got governments trying to choose technologies that are the most popular perspective based on, on what they think is right. And governments have a horrible track record of choosing technologies that ultimately prevail. The market has an incredible record of choosing the best opportunities to, to control carbon. So I think that that really is the best option. And getting, getting the political system to align on something like that is proven to be incredibly difficult. Now, you, you, yes, the, 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 carbon, the, the carbon production in, uh, in the U.S. Is, is in the top ten in the world, but I would also say that the US, U.S. has made more progress towards carbon reduction than any, any country on the planet. Uh, if you go back to the Paris Accords, the U, U.S. didn't sign the Paris Accords, but they beat any country on the planet that did sign the Paris Accords in terms of reducing our carbon footprint. The number one thing that did that was natural gas. Replacing coal with natural gas has driven the, the carbon footprint of the U.S. down dramatically, and there are still places in the world that, that consume a tremendous amount of coal, uh, but there's resistance to replacing that uh, coal with natural gas because everyone wants to jump to the ultimate perfect solution, and there are intermediate solutions that can come into play that can, can address the problem, but there's this, there's this absence of political will to push back and say, okay, I hear what you're saying. It would be great if the whole world could, could run off of hydrogen, but we can't afford to do that today, so what, what can we afford to do? Let's, let's stop talking about things that we can't do and start talking about things that we can do to make a difference, and I think we'd all be much better off. Another question. If, if they don't ask, then I have all the tough questions. I know, I know. Still to go, so. So uh, there's a lot of discussion of <clears throat> when peak oil is going to be met in maybe <clears throat> five years, 10 years, 15. But there's a, there's a major use of hydrocarbons in the chemical world. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the... Where do you see that going, and, and why do you see that growth continuing? The fastest, the fastest growing segment of 
the use of a barrel of oil or a barrel oil equivalent is, is in petrochemical use. And, and those elements really are what makes modern life possible. If you look at an iPhone, if you look at a Tesla, if you look at just about anything that you really enjoy using, it's got chemicals, it's got petrochemicals and plastics in there. The, the world would be a much less sustainable place without petrochemicals and plastics. So that's going to continue to grow. I don't, I'm not a geophysicist or geologist, but I, I don't believe that there is going to be a peak oil. There may be a peak demand for oil, uh, but I think that, you know, that, that oil will be around for a very long time because the amount of oil necessary to support petrochemicals for a growing world population is, <clears throat> is, is small compared to the energy consumption. But I think that at some point, the, <laughs> at some point the world's going to want to conserve uh, pet, uh, uh, crude oil to be able to produce the petrochemicals we need. But I also believe, and we're recognizing now, that there's a circular economy out there developing around petrochemicals, particularly around plastics, uh, that we can take plastics instead of letting them end up out in the ocean, out in the environment, that we can responsibly manage plastics when they're in, at the end of their useful life, bring them back into the system. Mechanical recycling is not much good because mechanical recycling degrades the properties of plastics. And so you can, you can take milk jugs and turn them into a park bench, but then you're done. Um, you know, we are involved in processes where it's truly circular. We can take those plastics, break them down into, back into their molecular components, and then make brand new virgin plastics out of them that have the properties of, you know, of, of any other virgin plastic. So ultimately that will kick in and, and uh, get critical mass and be part of that as well. So there's, there's a balance to be struck over the long term, but certainly petrochemicals are growing at a faster rate today than energy consumption of hydrocarbons. This is a follow-up question from Michael, so it was a good setup. But so, so there, there's a, a anti-industry sentiment that's growing um, with uh, you know against the petrochemical, chemical, oil and gas industries, and, and it's rising with conversations on the climate movement on. Um, the Global Plastics Treaty um, negotiation, which the Baker Institute is is a part of, and, and and conversations around sustainability. So, how do you balance the conversation with the the general public and policymakers that really don't have a deep understanding on the the role of plastics, the role of hydrocarbon that they play in in just everyday living and in a diversified and advanced um, future of, of of energy. I think it is critically important to, to educate people, to educate forums like this. You've got a room full of brilliant people that maybe don't understand all of the dynamics around petrochemicals and energy use. And if you arm brilliant people with the facts, they'll, they, they'll make good choices. We've got to overcome this negative narrative uh, around energy, around petrochemicals and plastics to make people realize their true value. And, that, and the problem is, there's, there's an emotional argument on the other side. You, you see a picture in National Geographic of a turtle with a straw protruding its nose. That's a very emotional thing to overcome. And that's not a plastics problem. That's, that's a human responsibility problem. And when we educate from you know, toddlers on up that these are good materials, but you have to put them in this container so they can go back to where they can be reprocessed. That's, that's the bigger challenge. And when we think about educating the population uh, through our, our, uh, our industry associations, we know that there are people that you'll never convince. And we know that there are people that, you'll all, that are already convinced, but there's this majority in the middle that are persuadable, and we have to get our message out to them to help them understand the benefits that these materials bring to their lives. And if they're handled appropriately, they're, they're very benign. And without them, their lives are less sustainable. Uh, if you, you know, I always uh, uh, find it curious that uh, you know, someone will want to give me uh, a, a bottle of water that was produced in Europe in a, in a glass container that had to be transported to the US because they don't want me to drink it from a PET bottle. And their carbon footprint is probably 10 times 
what doing it this way is. And so there's things that people feel good about doing that are absolutely 100% out of sync with what they believe. And so we've got to start aligning their actions with their beliefs. Yes, Art. Yeah. No, well, actually, uh, right behind you. I'm, I'm overruling, and we'll come back to you next. <laughs> thank you, Judge, and I did vote for you back in the day. I, and Mark, thank you so much for being here and opening yourself up and your company and just explaining your thought process. I think it's great. <laughs> A question on capital allocation, if you will. It sounds like absent the JV with Chevron, you're mainly U.S. Do you see big capital all allocations in the next 10 to 20 years going outside the U.S.? And collateral question, have you ever lived or worked outside the U.S.? Uh, with, from our perspective, what we do around refining and what we do around midstream the most competitive place to be on the planet is right here in the U.S. and primarily in Texas. If you're, if you're going to process oil and gas or if you're going to use natural gas to produce energy to process those things, we can, we can make gasoline and diesel and jet fuel and export it anywhere in the world and be competitive. So our, our capital allocation from that perspective will stay here. Petrochemicals. Uh, we, we need to go where we can have access to the lowest cost feedstocks on the planet. That's the Middle East and that's the U.S. And so we balance, balance those investments there. And so, yeah, our, our capital allocation will be uh, where we can generate the greatest value for our investors, for our shareholders. We have, uh, we spent six years in Singapore. Uh, I had the good fortune to move there with Phil's Petroleum Company. Uh, and then Chevron Phillips Chemical was formed while we were there, and uh, and we we uh, we were in Singapore for six years, and it was when Asia was taking off. It was 1999 to 2005, and it was a fantastic experience. I've also spent a tremendous amount of time in the Middle East. I I I, f I feel like I've lived there, but I've only traveled there a tremendous number of times, uh, both Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and have a great affinity for the people there as well, and 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 the culture there as well. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I cover the downstream, but my news feed for the last three days has been very dominated by a big deal in the upstream. Mm -hmm. What does the Exxon Pioneer merger mean for independent refiners and the American energy industry more broadly, from your perspective? Well, it's it's a big it's a big deal. It's a big merger, but when you look at the competitive landscape, it's still a very diverse group of companies that are that are out producing oil and so it doesn't I don't think it it moves the needle it does, they're not cornering the market on oil production uh, and uh, but they are going to be very large in the Permian Basin and we we are a midstream company that takes away primarily natural gas liquids from from that basin and so we're, we're looking at it from that perspective and we we intend to get bigger in that business as well and be stronger in that business because we have anticipated that there's going to be consolidation in the Permian Basin. So we're going to we're going to make sure that we're positioned to be a great service provider uh, for for Exxon and all their peers in the Permian. Good. Well, I, I want to wrap up with. Was there a question over here? One more. Okay. Um, hi, Mark. Uh, Naomi Kling with Houston Business Journal. I just wanted to ask, I've been hearing a lot in the space about kind of demand with refining and petrochemicals, and I know you've mentioned a bit about, you know, growing need for hydrocarbons and petrochemicals, but I'm curious where you see in the next five or ten years demand for refining versus petrochemicals is going to go and how you expect Philip 66 to respond to that. Yeah, absolutely. No, we, we study that a lot. Uh, the growth story is petrochemicals. Uh, petrochemical demand on a global basis grows at a multiple of GDP. So if GDP is 3%, demand for petrochemicals is gonna be like something like four or 5%. And so there, it's, it's a growth business. Refining, we absolutely believe that in, in the US, we've hit peak gasoline demand uh, and the not too distant future, same with diesel and jet. We've got a cost position 
that will allow us to export what the U.S. doesn't need into the world markets, and so we'll be fine from a U.S. perspective. But what we're focusing on is how do we position our refineries for the future? What refineries do we need to invest in to make sure that they're resilient and that they can adjust what they make based on the demand for gasoline going down faster than the demand for diesel and jet fuel, and then feather in our opportunities to support that through renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. So we're, we're going to have a strong future. It's just going to be, it's not a growth business, but we have to be really, really good at it to compete. And that's our plan. Okay. Well, this hour has gone very quickly, but uh, in the spirit of a presidential debate, I'm going to give you kind of a last word, but I'm okay. going to set it up with a question. Uh, you know, Philip 66 actually has a statement on mission and values, which says providing energy and improving lives and safety, honor and commitment. Take that as a way of what's the future for Philip 66? Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that vision yep. uh, in a rough and tumble energy world it is a rough and tumble energy world it's a rough and tumble world all the way around things are changing fast and whether it's your personal life or your professional life or or as a corporation it's absolutely critical that you you have a clear picture of what your mission is what why are you there what what are you doing why do you exist and then perhaps even more importantly you have to have values that you can measure every decision by. Otherwise, you'll get whipshod by everything going out there and you'll make bad decisions for bad reasons. And we're here to provide energy and improve lives, full stop. That's what we do, that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna make decisions that generate value for our shareholders because we're a publicly traded company. We won't exist if we don't generate value for our shareholders. And we're gonna make those decisions through the lens of safety honor and commitment. We're not going to hurt people. We're going to keep our people safe in our plants. We're going to make decisions for the right reasons. And we're committed to our communities. We're committed to our employees and we're committed to our shareholders to, to generate value for them. And those are the lenses that we have to make every decision through. And sometimes we have to make tough decisions. Last year, we, we limit over, eliminated over 1,100 positions. And there's going to be more this year that have been, that have been announced. And that's tough to do. But you have to do it to ensure that the company is resilient and can compete and has a future. And, can, and, and so you can deliver on those values of safety, honor, and commitment uh, for, the, for the long term. And so that's, that's really what you need to face a tumultuous world is you got to be grounded, you got to be anchored in values and, and your mission that you intend to deliver against. Mark, the Baker Institute takes great pride in having leaders grace us on this stage and you have continued that legacy. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Glacier. Thank you.